today we finish up chapter 3 with 3.5, which is solving equations and inequalities with absolute values. So remember, absolute values tell the distance a number or an expression is from 0. So for a is greater than 0 and an algebraic expression of x, um, the absolute value of x equals a is equivalent to x equal a or x equals negative a. That's kind of a different way of thinking about absolute values than maybe you've done in the past, because when we think of taking the absolute value of something, we're like, well, then it's a positive answer, and you're correct. But what this is stating here when x equals a or x equals negative a is that if we were to stick the negative form inside of that absolute value, we would still get out a positive. And so that's how we're actually going to approach solving these. If we have the absolute value of x equal to something, what we're going to do is we're going to split our absolute value into two separate equations, where 1 equals a positive a and 1 equals a negative a, and we're going to solve to find the values that that holds true for. And we're going to do that regardless of if it's an equation or an inequality. to see a really basic form first just to kind of make sense of what this x equals a or x equals negative a nonsense means let's just solve for the absolute value of x equals 5 if the absolute value of x equals 5 then what can x be? Five or five. that's right that's how we get that a and negative a thing 5 or negative 5. Because if we stick either one of those inside of an absolute value, we're going to get out positive 5. Because positive 5 is 5 units away on the number line from 0. Um, and negative 5 is still 5 units away from 0 on a number line. It's just in a different direction. So how do we actually approach this, though, whenever our equations are a bit more complex? What you're going to want to do is you want to isolate your absolute value. So if it's not by itself, that is your first goal. In the second example, we see that it is not by itself. The first thing we're going to do is we are going to add this 1 over to the other side so that we have absolute value of x minus 3 equals a positive 5. Once we're there, we're going to split and we're going to work two equations at the same time. Okay, what I mean by that is I'm going to have x minus 3 equals positive 5 because what's inside here could be equal to positive 5 if the absolute value is positive 5. Or the x minus 3 could be equal to negative 5. Because if what's inside of my absolute value equals a negative 5, taking the absolute value of that will still get me to the positive 5. So I split it. Notice that what's inside the absolute values stays exactly the same. You don't do anything to it. It stays exactly the same. What you do is you have a positive version of the answer and a negative version of the answer, and we solve. So I'm going to add 3 to both sides, so I get x equals 8, and I do the same thing here. I add 3 to both sides, but over here I have negative 5 plus 3, which gives me a negative 2. So x has to be 8, or x has to be negative 2 for this absolute value to hold. But the key thing is what's inside the absolute values does not change. 
just the sign on what it's equal to does. Okay, questions on that one? Okay, let's try another one. 9 minus the absolute value of x minus 2 equals 7. What should we do? Do what? Okay. Okay, and we'll subtract the 9 over. So we have negative absolute value of x minus 2, absolute value equals negative 2. Now what? Yep. Yep, there's still a negative sign there. We don't just get to forget about it. So we either multiply everything by negative 1 or divide everything by negative 1, however you like to think about it, so that we have x minus 2 inside our absolute value equals positive 2. So now we split to where we have x minus 2 equals 2 and x minus 2 equals a negative 2. Could you also just move the absolute value? Yeah. Yeah, you could move the absolute value like from that first step and then subtract the 7 over. That's totally fine, too. Just make sure you get the absolute value by itself and any constants or other terms over to the other side. So add 2 and we get x equals 4, or add 2, we get x equals 0. Bless you. Bless you. Any questions on those first three? Okay, what happens then if we're dealing with inequalities instead of equations? Well, if A is positive and we have an algebraic expression x, then if we have the absolute value of x is less than a, that's saying the same thing as negative a is less than x, which is less than a. And these hold true if the signs are less than or equals to as well. So really, if the absolute value of x is less than a, we're doing the exact same process that we just did. It's just we're now going to have a complex inequality. That's one of those ones where we have three sides, but we do the same thing on all these sides. If the absolute value of x is greater than a, though, then we have a split. Then we have x is less than negative a, or x is greater than positive a. When we do equations, or excuse me, inequalities with our absolute values, almost always you will be asked to graph them, and we will graph them using number lines. We will graph them using um, either using the parentheses and brackets or the open circle closed circles. I believe on the Pearson site they're always multiple choice. Try and keep those little rules up there as I slide up for our first one. Solve and graph the absolute value of 3x plus 2 is less than 5. When we have it as less than our a, we can do a complex inequality. 
what's inside of our absolute value stays exactly the same. So I'm going to have 3x plus 2. And then this part on the right still stays is less than 5. What we add to that is we put less than on the other side, and then we put the negative of our answer, the negative 5. And now we solve this just like we would a complex inequality. We would subtract 2 from all three sides so that we would have negative 7 is less than 3x, which is less than 3. And then we would divide all three sides by 3. So we have negative 7 thirds is less than x, which is less than 1. Now, it does say graph it, so I'm going to make a number line over here. Put zero in the middle, one, two, negative one, negative two. Negative seven thirds is like two and one third negative. Am I gonna use open circles or closed circles or am I gonna use open circles? We use open circles because it's less than. If it's less than or equal to, we use closed circles. Um, just to kind of not make it muddy, I'm going to use parentheses, though. Open circles are the same thing as parentheses, whereas closed circles are the same thing as brackets. Yep, I know, you can't see it. There you go. So I'm going to use parentheses just because it looks a little cleaner. So at negative two and a third, I would have a parenthesis. And I'm opening it towards the right because it's saying negative seven thirds is less than x. That means x has to be greater than that value. x is greater than that value headed towards the right. The other half of my inequality states that x has to be less than one. So at one, I'm gonna put the other parenthesis opening towards the middle. All of these values that lie in between are the values that hold for this inequality. That would actually work for this absolute value inequality. Anything outside of that range would not work. When you have an absolute value is less than a positive number like this, you will always have a situation where the middle gets shaded in, as it were. Are there questions on how I did any part of this? Okay, let's try another one. 5 minus 2x is greater than or equal to 1. So this is the other situation. Whenever it's greater than, then we have to split it. What's inside the absolute value stays the same. But when I'm comparing it to the negative version, I'm going to have it be less than or equal to. Or what's inside my absolute value is going to be greater than or equal to the positive version. When I graph this on my line, as you will see here in a minute, what's going to happen is where I have a part shooting off to the left towards negative infinity, and I'm going to have a part shooting off to the right towards positive infinity. They're not going to be shaded in the middle like our last one was because these are not going to overlap. So now I'm going to work on solving. I'm going to subtract 5, divide both sides by negative 2, but what happens when I divide? It flips my sign around because I'm dividing by a negative. Do the exact same process on the right-hand um, inequality. Subtract that 5. Divide by negative 2 so that I am, again, having to flip my sign. So I find that x has to be greater than or equal to 3 
or x has to be less than or equal to 2. You're good. Okay. Here's the rules. Yep. All I'm stating here is that if the signs change, like this all holds true if this says less than or equal to. This all holds true if this says greater than or equal to. That's all this similar thing says. So instead of writing these two lines again with less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, I'm just saying understand that these rules hold if the sign is got that line underneath it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. I guess I didn't expect there to be the negative, like split into the positive and negative, or the A on the greater than or equal to or less than or equal to? Well, it's only going to split when it's the absolute value is greater than A. You do the complex inequality if it's less than or less than or equal to A. Okay. Does that make more sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So we split this one into the two, not because it's got that equals to, but because our inequality, our absolute value is greater than or equal to this. The last one we did up here was less than. And when it's less than, we just make it a complex, and the sign stays the same way. When it's greater than, like here, that's when we have to split it. Does that make more sense? Yes. You're good. I'm going to make my number line. Now, if x is greater than or equal to positive 3, you can either do a closed circle at positive 3 or a bracket, whichever you prefer. But since x has to be greater than or equal to positive 3, I'm making it open to the right. And I'm going to have my big arrow, and I'm going to shade in everything that is above or equal to 3. I do the exact same thing for x is less than or equal to 2. To be less than, I have to be to the left of, left and less than. Again, though, I use a bracket because it is less than or equal to. Big arrow and shade everything less than. So really, all we're doing is eliminating all the numbers between 2 and 3. Which you're like, well, that's not very many, but there's actually infinitely many numbers between 2 and 3 that we just eliminated out as a not solutions to this inequality. Questions? Okay. What if I had you, let's go back up to this one, the first one up here. So we got this as our inequality. What if I wanted that written as an interval notation? What would that look like? give you a hint. This is one of the reasons why I like using the parentheses and the brackets over the circles. So the reason I like to use these parentheses and brackets is because right off of my graph, I can have my interval notation because I'm going to have parentheses, my lower limit, which is the negative 7 thirds, comma, my upper limit, end parentheses, and there's my interval notation for that solution set. And I know a lot of people hate it because it looks like an ordered pair, and I totally get that, and I kind of agree a little bit that they could have come up with a slightly different notation. But 
luckily when we talk about this, we're not talking about graphene on a Cartesian coordinate system, so there shouldn't be that confusion. But now that we've done it up here, what is the interval notation for this solution set? Okay, but what goes in between those? Union. Yep, you union them. Intersection would mean that they would overlap and have something in common. So union is where you take all of that first set and you combine it with all of the second set. So yes, that is how you would do that. Great job. Now... We've got two other situations that could pop up that if you're not pausing to think for a moment, you're going to mess up on. So notice on our notes, A had to be greater than zero. You see that? A had to be positive. And all, all these, they were positive to start with. So what happens then? when the examples that were given are negative. Okay, don't jump too quick on that horse. Not all of them are no solution. So remember, absolute values tell us the distance away from zero. And we never talk about the distance away from zero as being negative because it's just a difference in direction. We're going towards the right so many units or we're going towards the left so many units. We're not talking about being negative. And so the fact that these say negative should make us pause. Now this first one says the absolute value of 2x minus 4 is less than negative 5. Can the absolute value of anything be less than a negative 5? No, because you're always going to get a positive solution, or the very smallest thing you could get is 0. The absolute value of 0 is 0. So this one is no solution. And I have a nice explanation there. As A is greater than 0, no, as A is less than 0, I don't know why it says greater than, ignore that part, flip that sign. Um, and since the absolute value gives a positive solution, there's no way to have a positive solution that is less than negative 5. So my reasoning holds, my sign is backwards, and I need to go fix that in my notes. So if you see an absolute value that is completely isolated in terms of an inequality, and it's set where it's less than that negative um, value, then you know automatically there's no solution. But what if it says, like our second example? Our second example says the absolute value of 7 minus x is greater than or equal to negative 4. But what did we just discuss was the smallest value that an absolute value could equal? 0. zero. Is 0 greater than or equal to negative 4? Yes. yes. So that means anything can work. All answers, negative infinity to positive infinity, works for the second example. Because we're always going to get a positive solution. And since the original problem says greater than or equal to a negative solution, we know we're always going to be greater than that. Taking the absolute value is always going to give us at least 0, if not something positive. So when we see that negative, we can't just immediately assume that it's no solution. We have to check to see which way the sign is going. If it's saying absolute value is less than a negative number, there's no solution. If it says the absolute value is greater than or greater than or equal to a negative number, then it's all solutions. They all hold up.